welcome to our <laughs> webinar today titled Unleash Your Content. I'm Lisa Collins, Head of Membership Engagement at IAABM, and we are very pleased to be powering this event on behalf of Novelsat. There will be time for Q&A at the end, so please be sure to place your questions you have in the tab below. Now, let me hand over to our speaker, Aviv Rone, who's VP of Marketing and Product at Novelsat. Aviv, over to you. Hi, thank you very much, Lisa, and uh, hello, everybody. I hope you'll find uh, this uh, webinar interesting. Uh, and uh, without further ado, uh, let me uh, start uh, the webinar. Uh, the webinar titled Unleash Your Content, and we'll be talking about uh, content connectivity. And we will start by talking, by introducing, first of all, uh, a little bit of novel stuff for those of you who might be less familiar uh, with us. Uh, second, uh, we'll review some uh, major market trends that we see across uh, the industry, especially in three major areas. One is a broadcast, second is the mobile, and third is a satellite. And towards the end, we'll review some of NovelSat broadcast and delivery solutions uh, for these markets addressing the changing uh, needs and the requirements uh, of customers and addressing uh, the evolution of the requirements. So a little bit about uh, NovelSat. We are a leading content connectivity solution uh, provider, providing solutions for two major market segments. One is a broadcast, and this is the topic uh, of our webinar, and second is broadband uh, content connectivity. We have hundreds of customers around the world with the many thousands of installation, both for broadcast and broadband. And probably each one of you is probably an end user of one of our services as we carry a lot of the world the major events and sport events as well as major deployments at the broadband connectivity. We are focused on four main uh, growth area and growth markets, uh, two under the title broadcast and two under the uh, broadband. Uh, and those are 5G video, which I'll touch a little bit as it's not the focus of our webinar, but uh, mobile today is a major part of our uh, video experiences and live experiences. Video networks, data connectivity, and mission critical. For these uh, markets, we support multiple applications. Under the broadcast, we have solutions for content distribution, content contribution, SNG and outdoor, content delivery networks. On the broadband side, we have solutions for trunking and backhaul, enterprise and utilities, government and defense, cloud and IoT. And we also have solutions for health observation and uh, more recently, solutions for 5G video delivery. So that was a little bit about NovelSat. And now I would like to go over some of the major trends and evolutions that we see in three segments of the market. One is a broadcast, second is a mobile, and the third, as I said, is a satellite. Starting with the broadcast. When we talk about broadcast, it all starts with, or we tell all ends at, the user experience. And user experience is evolving. User wants more. They want better. They want more immersive experience. And if we try to uh, illustrate what this means, more, better, in immersive, then there are many di dimensions to this evolution. First, we see more content, a lot more volume of content. We are flooded with content, live and on demand, many types of content, a huge variety of content, uh, sports, uh, titles, films, series. We see more and more content, and sometimes I feel I don't have uh, enough hours in the day to watch what I really want to watch out of this uh, selection. So there's many users who want more and more content. Obviously, more content, requires more bandwidth to be delivered from the network, and this is something that we need to take into account. Even more than that, content is improving, improving in multiple dimensions. 
improving in resolution. We see content shifting from SD to HD, to ultra high definition from 4K to 8K. Content is getting better and better resolution. We see also improvement in HDR, moving to better and better high dynamic range, or from none to high dynamic range. We see shift toward high frame rates, giving us a better experiences, letting, uh, enabling us even to view the little details, as to say. And also more and more white color gamut, better color depth to have a more vivid image. We also, and obviously all this is also requiring a higher bandwidth. Obviously the better the resolution, the better the picture, the better the image, it would require more megabit to be delivered and higher bandwidth for. When we talk about going more immersive, then we see already introduction of more immersive content. We see multi-view coming in. Images that are now being delivered to us or videos that are now being delivered to us from multiple angles. So we can better experience whatever it is that is watching. We are watching uh, 360 videos, immersive, that we can see everything all around us. And even virtual reality or uh, XR and VR that actually provide us a more realistic video to enable us more realistic experiences. We also see more choices and features uh, going uh, for uh, the users want. They want to control the timeline. They want to control the viewpoint. They want to see more data about what it is that they're watching. They want to have add-on data so they can maybe figure out uh, some statistics about the game or some information about the actor or additional information that comes uh, with that uh, title or uh, video. Uh, we see the need for more personalization. We want to, to adjust the video to our need and to be better uh, reflect what is it that we want to see and the way we want to see it. And we also see the need for social experience. We want to share that uh, experience with others maybe not in the same room with us, and we would like to do it over the network, and we would like both to see and maybe chat or maybe talk uh, alongside uh, the experience. So that experiences are also getting more and more complex and also but more and more interesting to the viewers and to the users. When we talk also on the media delivery, we talked about the users, but now we, let's talk about the media delivery to the users. Here also, we see multiple trends. We see multiple trends in the networks and, and, and the screen and on the formats, making ever the delivery more and more, let's say, challenging. Because now we need to face multiple, uh, multiple forage applications and, sorry, that's, seems to be novel, that's why. Okay, we see uh, content ubiquity. At first, we used to consume content only on our loud screens at home. But now, even when we are at home, we're consuming content on multiple screens. Some of it is a traditional legacy TV. Some of it is obviously tablets, laptops, PCs, uh, smartphones, and more. We also consume content and want to consume content at work. Even at the office, obviously, we would like to stay connected to the experience, even if we are outside of a building, even when we are on board, on board an airplane or on board a, a cruise ship or a ferry, and we would like to be still connected and consume this video content. We already starting to see video coming also into cars. Let's have the takes the entertainment with us into our cars and soon when our cars will be driving themselves we'll have uh, more time to enjoy this uh, media and content and obviously content is today on our first screen which is our mobile device so we take it everywhere where we are out and about and we consume the content from that screen as well 
And I'll elaborate a little bit on mobile later, but obviously now we have content ubiquity on different locations. The content also get to the users now on different networks. It's not just the broadcast network that traditionally it was. Now we have both broadcast and broadband network delivery. We are utilizing both wired and wireless networks to deliver the media. We're doing that over fixed and mobile networks. Those networks could be managed or unmanaged. Those networks could be private or public networks. Those networks could utilize cloud architecture or head architecture or both. So we, have, we need now a converged distribution to go over multiple types of network and deliver the experience. And obviously deliver the experience at the same way that we are getting accustomed to when we watch it at home. So we want the same quality, we want the same uh, uh, latency, we want the same experience. So everything now needs to be converged across multiple distribution channels. We also see the need to support multiple technology and pro technologies and protocols. Uh, we sh as we go over multiple networks, uh, now we see also multiple formats. Uh, we see the evolution of videos uh, toward the uh, different formats. So we have different formats for the connectivity, whether it's IP network or SDI or ASI or wireless. We're familiar with the broadcast uh, variation of protocols. Coding is improving. We had H.264, now 265, now coming 266 evolving all the time, the coding on video, but we need to support all because the transition is not uh, one, zero to one. Transition, during the transition time, we need to support also the legacy and the new standards that are coming in. Also for streaming, uh, while there are legacy old standards, more like uh, RTMP or RTSP, and there is numerous streaming standards like HLS and SRT and MPEG Dash, we still need our network to support all these in order to deliver the experiences across all network. And of course, we have streamed diversity. As I've mentioned, not only the TV is now what we consume content at, it also could be a PC, a laptop, a tablet, a smartphone, maybe a screen on a certain platform like in the car entertainment, and so on. So we have also multiple screens, and those screens also have different requirements. Obviously, not just image size, but also uh, image uh, bandwidth and uh, weight in the uh, megabits, and so on. And we need the networks to be uh, capable of delivering these different differentiated experiences. Not to mention that content need to be protected. If it's not protected, then we face piracy issues. And as we see sport media rights revenues eating new uh, bars uh, and new uh, peaks every year, and our forecast had to reach uh, $85 billion by 2024, obviously piracy becomes more of a concern and could uh, jeopardize the sport and the cinema and TV business models and obviously we need to, content, to protect the content when it's being delivered to the users across the different network. And there is of course the other side, there is the content production. Also content production is evolving, becoming more diverse, more agile, becoming smarter. And as we see this, uh, the need for uh, more and more agility at the content production. We see that uh, we produce not only studio production and live events, but we have more and more distributed and remote production facilities where we generate the content. We see also more and more on production when a lot of the content is now being produced at home or at uh, small locations not by professionals like at the studios or at the live events. 
and all this content is being delivered and eventually need to be carried out through the media delivery network to the users. We see also more production intelligence. We see more and more automation of the production process. We see the introduction of artificial intelligence, AI, into the workflows. We see machine learning introduction into the workflows. And we see metadata introduction as well. Uh, and we actually see this uh, already today, and we see new and new, uh, newer, newer uh, functionalities being introduced into production, enabling us to add uh, beautify effects, real-time subtitling, content reviewing to identify uh, illegal or uh, immoral content. We do a thumb thumbnail extraction or content interpretation. Uh, intelligent uh, video guides and so on. So we see more and more intelligence also on the production side. Obviously, this needs to be, uh, again, supported throughout the entire media value chain. When we talk about bringing it all together, then we see that delivering the media to the users eventually requires hyper-connectivity. A lot of bandwidth, a lot of experiences across multiple networks to reach any screen, anywhere, anytime. From production to the media delivery, we see the need to have the network more agile to support the variety and the multiplicity of the standards, of the protocols, of the networks, of the workflows, of the processes, all that are now becoming and translated into network and platform and equipment requirements. So this is uh, what we see on the evolution of the broadcast value chain. But there is also an evolution, an important evolution in mobile. In mobile, Mobile today is the main growth channel for content delivery. We consume more and more content over mobile networks, more and more content over smartphones and tablets connected uh, to, uh, to the cellular networks. And this is a different network altogether with different challenges. When we look uh, into the network today, we see that already today, Video dominates most of the traffic that uh, is being carried out in cellular network. Most of the mobile traffic is video as it is. So if uh, we kind of had the, the second generation as a voice network, the third generation as a data network, now fourth generation and even more so will be uh, fifth generation is actually a content delivery network because eventually they carry content more than anything else. And this will only focus that uh, to intensify as uh, we use uh, our mobile to consume more and more uh, mobile. Yeah, more and more video, sorry. Looking into the future of 5G, uh, here we can see some uh, statistics uh, from Ericsson forecasting uh, what business, what is the business potential of 5G and uh, in what segment does it lie the most? And we can see that video and AR and VR services is uh, actually uh, the largest segment, the largest business potential for 5G. And obviously, this is a, a major thing for mobile network operators uh, as well as for broadcasters. But mobile networks and cellular networks will not only support mobile devices, we already see today the introduction of TVs that are 5G enabled. We see TVs that are coming with a SIM or a free to air connectivity to the 5G network, enabling to, uh, con the consumption of video content directly to the screen 
uh, without the need for any terrestrial connectivity or streamer. We can see uh, Huawei already launched one, Samsung launched one, I think there's already been a few other launched one. And, and this is obviously also uh, very challenging uh, for the networks. As you can see here, this demonstration delivering uh, an 8K uh, video to over a 5G network would consume over 160 meg. And this is just for a single video stream. Obviously, this is becoming challenging also for video networks that will need uh, to tackle this issue. When we talk about the opportunities in mobile, then it's actually twofold. twofold. It says two sides. One is MNOs, and second is a BNO, the broadcast network operator. The mobile network operators have already identified live video streaming as a major consumer application they intend to offer in order to generate additional revenues. They see live video streaming as a major revenue opportunity uh, coming from their network and new capabilities. Uh, and also uh, throughout uh, even other uh, application Lower here at this graph, we can see on-demand content and AR and VR application and uh, in-car entertainment and other applications that are related to video. So this is definitely a, a new market for video and media. We can see also here the broadcast network operator's expectation from the cellular network. And when they looked at 5G, they see 5G as the future network to carry media and content to the user, eventually replacing other distribution network like uh, DTT or DTV and uh, satellite and becoming the preferred access to TV content. And this is again a major shift uh, when we see that we use more and more our screens, then we need to think how can we enable the same experiences as we have in our living room also on our mobile devices. There's a, another report here that I'm quoting from Ericsson, uh, and this is, is, does people really want to consume this kind of application, for example, like live? content, live TV, 5G TV, as this application is called, uh, over the mobile devices and whether they'll be willing to pay for it. And according to a very recent uh, research that was carried out, they found out that people do want to pay for this service. And actually, 5G TV is a leading service out of all other 5G potential services that they are willing to pay for. And actually, 67% of the responders in this research actually said they are willing to pay for it. And they actually said that they are willing to pay for 20 to 30% more for these kind of entertainment services, these kind of TV-based and video-based services. So this is obviously something that mobile network operators are now looking at becoming more like a broadcaster and also bundling this offering together with the broadband offering, utilizing the 5G flavor or fixed wireless access is a major opportunity to offer more than just broadband connectivity, but offer both broadband and broadcast services over the 5G network. And when people sometimes wonder, does people still want to watch uh, even live on mobile or even live at all today with all the streaming? Then we can refer to uh, the latest uh, uh, information that uh, Nielsen is actually testing this every month. There might be already a newer uh, breakdown that we can see, still see that uh, about 70% of people still watch live content more than anything else. Although we see streaming and some of the streaming application also include uh, live content like Hulu Live and uh, YouTube TV, we see that live linear still dominate our TV time. On top of the trends 
it's a broadcast market and mobile market, we also would like to highlight some of the trends uh, that are going on on the satellite. A satellite is today the art of broadcast delivery for contribution and distribution and even direct to home. When we talk about satellite, it's being uh, the number one uh, media delivery uh, platform to deliver today's content due to its very high reliability, uh, due to the SLA that it's being provided for media delivery, and it's being used for fixed and uh, outdoor contribution, occasional use contribution, onward to distribution, primary distribution, as well as direct to home uh, distribution, and as well connectivity to DTT towers, and in the future also to uh, cellular towers maybe, I'll highlight this uh, as well as another opportunity that could be. And so definitely satellite is a major part of the broadcast uh, industry, carrying today about 45,000 global TV channels over satellite. Also here, we can see several trends, several major trends. First, we see how much broadcasters are spending to carry media over satellite. In 2019, the number was $7.1 billion, and we can see the breakdown here. First and foremost, it was distribution, and then, and then very close to it was DTH. And then, obviously, occasional use consumes less and contribution consumes less. So we see about $1 billion for contribution. This is a major capacity spending for the industry for delivering the content, whether globally or regionally or locally. But the channels, there is 45,000 channels that are being carried are also being transitioning. The transition from, eight, from uh, standard definition to high defini definition, HD. We can see that uh, until recently we had about 13,000 channels in HD, while all other were still uh, standard definition. And in the coming years, this is forecasted to double and even more. We can see also the introduction of ultra high definition channels, mostly 4K as we could see more and more, for example, sport content going this way. We could see the Olympics, for example, Tokyo Olympics was broadcasted all in, uh, in 4K already. And we see the number of channels carried over satellite actually multiplying nearly by 10 in the coming years uh, of uh, 4K uh, channels. Obviously, this requires more and more bandwidth. And efficiency now becomes a major issue for broadcaster as obviously more bandwidth comes with more cost. When we look on the satellite, on satellite transponder and trying to figure out how many channels we could have delivered or delivered in the past or in legacy technologies like DVBS and MPEG-2 and how many channels we would be able to deliver with DVB-S2 and MPEG-4, or even going to HEVC to carry 4K, we see that the better the modulation, even though that the modulation is improving, and even though that uh, the encoding is improving, we still carry less and less channels as video improves. In the past, we could carry 15 channels in MPEG-2 over DVB-S, now we can carry about nine channels on a single transponder in MPEG-4 over DVB-S2. And when moving to HEVC, we, carry, we can carry only three such channels over a single satellite transponder in DVB-S2. So there's definitely a need to transition not only to higher video compression, but also to better transmission modulation, better than DVB-S2, like DVB-S2X, or a novel sat NS4. Spectrum is also being challenged 
from another direction, from the 5G network. C-band became a primary spectrum band for 5G. It has some significant merits for 5G uh, networks and cellular networks. And we can see that a global shift across the whole world, and especially we can see this very much uh, highlighted and pushed uh, in, Europe, in the US, when the FCC put out uh, an accelerate, accelerated plan in order to accelerate the evacuation and the repurposing of major portion of the C-band from satellite use and broadcast use to 5G broadband use. And actually uh, providing an incentive plan of $10 billion to satellite operators to clear this spectrum within two to three years. So obviously there is an additional challenge from the seven spectrum uh, shift, which does not happen only in North America. It's a global trend. We can see multiple countries shifting a growing portion of the seven for the usage of terrestrial 5G. This obviously squeezes even more the video broadcast spectrums and driving even further the need to utilize better efficiencies in the delivery better modulation, and better video compression. Obviously, all this requires uh, the trends that we saw in the broadcast and in the mobile uh, and at the satellite requires to, uh, require to be addressed with solutions that are capable of supporting both the legacy uh, standards and the legacy channels and the legacy video formats and, and the, the media productions that we use as well as the new networks and the new uh, efficiencies and the new uh, capabilities that uh, needs to be delivered so we are now at a transition period where we need to support both let's say the old and the new and here i would like uh, to take you through uh, Novelstat uh, unique capabilities to address these major challenges. When we talk about broadcast and delivery solutions, we look at what I just uh, highlighted before, the need for hyperconnectivity and the need for network agility. When we talk about hyperconnectivity, where well, we need to deliver more content and higher quality, while saving on network bandwidth, saving on bandwidth cost, we need to be to deliver a better experience, but we also need to deliver it economically. Uh, so we, there is a need to go to higher performance and higher efficient, efficiency solutions. When we talk about network agility, we saw all the different dimensions that the networks are evolving to, the networks, the users, the screens, the protocols, the technologies, the formats. There are so many dimensions and we need networks and platforms that are flexible to support multiple architecture and support existing technologies as well as new technologies and to enable the networks to grow and to evolve and deliver new services and be able to, do, to deliver media processing to deliver universal delivery across all the networks. <coughs> Sorry. To deliver broadcast alongside OTT. And of course, to protect the content, which is so precious uh, today. Our architecture, our network architecture for delivering solutions to this market segment, are actually became server-based. We shifted from appliance, uh, uh, let's say monolithic appliances to a more flexible architecture, which enable us to address evolving needs as they are being required by the different uh, operators and uh, media providers and broadcasters. We are utilizing off-the-shelf platform as uh, the base uh, platform to introduce the capabilities on top of it. Introducing most of the, these capabilities as virtualized software in software capabilities, supporting more and more new features 
and new technologies, which are software-based. Supporting also multiple and versatile connectivity options. We can connect IP, we can connect to satellite, we can connect uh, to uh, ASI, we can connect to SDI, we can introduce into this platform a versatile connectivity options, one or more as needed. We also can introduce here multiple connectivity options for each. So we can hear here, for example, multiple satellite cards connecting to multiple satellites or connecting in, uh, uh, inbound and outbound so we can receive and transmit from the same platform or multiple reception and multiple transmission creating multiple gateways between the different connectivity options. This is a a very flexible architecture and it's also very compact which enable us uh, to be to deliver very very modular system on the one end but also very reliable system as it's being built on reliable off-the-shelf commercial platforms this agile approach has many merits it's enable us to accelerate transitioning to uh, digital services to adapt to the continuous change of the network. So if one introduces a certain set of capabilities today and would like to grow the capabilities tomorrow, this is becoming quite easily with this uh, kind of platform. So even as we develop features and capabilities in the future, we'll be able to introduce them on the same platform that uh, we will deliver today. It also enables us to streamline services and operation more easily and maximize the value for the network investment by utilizing these kind of capabilities and actually utilizing a common, this common architecture and common building blocks to create multiple product options. And we'll go through some of these uh, options and we'll see some of these uh, advanced uh, capabilities. Obviously, those kind of platforms are also easier to serve and maintain, and eventually it's all results in lower TCO. We have also a unique end-to-end -end system approach. When we look on this, our system uh, design goals, and uh, the way that we look at the system is that we would not, we do not, we don't like to have systems constructed of multiple boxes. We would like the system to be very flexible in a single box. We don't want to have one box that's doing, for example, moxing and one box that is doing the transmission and another box that is doing the video processing and so on. Those uh, solutions are very cumbersome, very not efficient, and eventually cost more both in CAPEX and OPEX. So when we look on our system uh, design goal and approach, we look at a system that have multiple input and output interfaces of all types to begin with. And then we have the processing layers on top of it. And those processing varies from elementary stream processing to transport stream processing, enabling modulation and demodulation for transmission, as well as a multiplexing and demultiplexing of the services. And of course, encryption and decryption, both for the elementary stream, as well as for the transport stream. This kind of uh, system approach enable us to create very agile and versatile products that will go through uh, in a second. Uh, together, co combining together the transmission, the video processing, the network security, the delivery, all in one, having any to any video gateway that can deliver and connect uh, to any network, deliver to any screen, and so on. When we look on our product portfolio, we have a very rich product portfolio for the broadcast needs, starting with a novel sat fusion, a broadcast and delivery platform, moving on to NovelSat Extreme, the multi-purpose gateway, and NovelSat Xnet, 
which is a satellite app system, which has also an important role in broadcast. And then we have our traditional uh, novel satellite modulators and demodulators. We have, of course, network management systems to manage these kind of network and platforms, and content security solutions, both for the transport and the elementary stream, broadcaster and bis 2 ca to protect the content. Let me start with the Fusion. This is a platform that uh, we've launched about uh, two years ago, uh, and it is now a kind of, a, let's say, that maybe the flagship of the solutions that we now deliver in terms of broadcast and delivery solution, enabling us to optimize everything onto a very flexible platform, uh, any to any gateway, working on public and private CDN network, unmanaged and managed, connecting to HTTP, HTTPS, uh, connecting to terrestrial network with XC and SRT interfaces, having encoding and decoding and transcoding capabilities up to 4K, as well as supporting ultra low latency transmission and delivery. When we look on the different building blocks of this platform, we can see the different capabilities. We can see here the encoding and transcoding capabilities, MOOCs and stat MOOCs, encryption, decryption, modulation to the most efficient satellite transmission, connectivity to wireless and wireline uh, networks, whether it's satellite or cloud or IP networks, and also having the capability to include packaging and origin servers in order to deliver content, streaming content to multiple devices, performing transcoding and ABR transcoding for OTT, enabling us to have linear, path-through, OTT ABR and SRT Zixi connectivity options that eventually support any input, any output at any format. A very flexible platform that uh, is already deployed at many, many customers and received the great feedbacks for its functionalities and flexibility. The second platform, a more recent platform that was introduced earlier this year, is the Xtreme. The Xtreme is a powerful multipurpose gateway, which includes multiple connectivity cards as well as a multiplexer and a gateway between IP, ASI, and RF. It's very high dense, could support many, many versatile input and output in a uh, 2U uh, form factors, as well as support multi-standard uh, of uh, satellite transmission, as well as connectivity to multiple satellites. It can receive input or send output to multiple satellites at the same time in a single platform. When looking into its video gateway capabilities, it supports IP and transport and service and bid level monitoring and bid and service redundancy based on the following ETR that you're probably familiar with. Seamless stream, port and packet level switching and service and filtering and Remax. Very, very flexible platform that can utilize many, many different services on top of it. Another platform that we've launched earlier this year and is already deployed at multiple customers is the XNEC, which is a leading edge satellite app system. It's a very compact, a flexible app that intended both for data as well as video. And it enables us to bind these two together so when we create a network of broadband, we can also deliver a video side by side this data to this remote location of our satellite. It has advanced dynamic resource management to better utilize the resources of the spectrum and allocating to each and every end device a changing bandwidth, whether this bandwidth could change in megahertz or it can change in megabit or it can change in power or it can change in, in different parameters or in modulation uh, dynamically in real time. 
enabling us to support up to 250 different remote locations uh, in a single cluster, and we can uh, tie as many clusters as we want uh, together. This platform could also be ideal for video contribution, uh, like we can see in the next slide here, providing us very high efficiency contribution where we can utilize this app to have more dynamic allocation of resources for occasional use. Typically, when we have uh, occasional use, it's not all at the same time. We have different vehicles uh, coming up at uh, different times for different locations, different events. And this system enables to reserve and allocate satellite capacity based on the service characteristics, make, uh, enabling us to have better efficiency of the satellite resources for occasional use. We also have our modulators and modulate, uh, demodulators. This has uh, been uh, our existing products for a long time, deployed by the thousands at uh, uh, many, many uh, networks and broadcasters, delivering very high bandwidth with very uh, capable uh, or advanced functionalities, uh, multiple uh, interfaces could support both IP and uh, traditional ASI uh, interfaces, supporting software-defined, uh, actually, operation of uh, the uh, transmission scheme, whether it's DVB S2, S2X, or our very uh, high-efficiency NS4, which is can deliver up to 20 or 30 percent, even more than DVB S2X. We also have solutions to protect the content and protect the content both with AES-256 for the transport stream and B2CA for elementary stream, enabling us to protect not only the payload, but also the entire transport and the headers and everything. And we also have a unique automatic dynamic heat generation system, network management system actually that manages this uh, generation and distribution over the air of the keys to the different takers. The first solution that we have for the transport stream is a broadcaster that is doing the encryption with AES-256 uh, and then encrypt again uh, twice actually the keys and then we have the system to deliver the keys to the takers and we have as well here, entitlement per service with scheduling and booking. And this is uh, already being deployed in many, many locations, uh, utilize, being used, by the way, for, let's say, many of the global and regional sports events. We've also introduced the latest standard for elementary stream, BIS2CA. Uh, this is something that has already been, again, uh, delivered and deployed. We support the different modes uh, of BIS2, and most interesting, BIS2CA, uh, delivering embedded conditional access solution within the same platform that you saw before, the Fusion. And it's, again, field proven, deployed at operators. And almost finalizing uh, the webinar, we have also the NovelNet, network management suite, carrier guide solution, which is focused on delivering services. Uh, and you can see one of the screens uh, that, uh, I don't know if you can read the small letters inside, but this is exactly how it looks when we can see the different services and the different channels. And it provides us very flexible monitoring and control of the network, both resources, and allocations and managing and monitoring, as well as obviously resolving issues as, uh, as there is a need. Also supporting maps uh, to see the entire deployments. And with this, I will wrap up uh, the webinar, exactly leaving uh, 10 minutes uh, for Q&A. Uh, you can find more information about our solution at our website novelsa.com, 
You can see here some of the uh, product sheets uh, that uh, you find on the website. You'll find additional uh, white papers and uh, webinars and additional product sheet for each and every product that uh, I've mentioned here very briefly. So if you would like to learn more, I invite you to go uh, into novelsa.com, go to the resource section or to the relevant product page and uh, just uh, simply download whatever is that you need. And with that, thank you very much. And I'll now open the floor for uh, questions. So we now you have the, the chat, right, Lisa? I think they can uh, just uh, type their... Uh, they certainly can be. And um, that was really interesting. Thank you so much and really quite thorough. We did have one question come in as you were presenting, and that was on your, um, your slide that looked at screen diversity. And they asked the question, why cinema is not included on that slide? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, actually, there are applications where uh, this is being uh, delivered uh, to cinemas as well. Uh, this is, uh, well, I must have overlooked that and uh, can definitely add that uh, as well. Uh, although cinemas uh, are not really uh, live content, and I was referring here more to live content, where people consume more live content, and cinemas are more of just, you know, uh, uh, file delivery to the cinema. So it's a little bit of different application. But uh, the, we can use the platform also for, for these kind of uh, capabilities. But it's the focus of my discussion and the platform that I presented was on live delivery. Excellent. Um, and another one here. They've asked whether you could explain the difference in efficiency between NS4 and DVS2. OK. So actually, uh, since, DVS, uh, since DVBS2 uh, came out, uh, we, we had the NS4, which actually can support up to 60% more capacity than S2. There's other also standard, by the way, DVB-S2X, which already can deliver much more than DVB-S2. And uh, we can deliver through a, a better waveform and a, a better uh, modulation and granularity. Uh, we can deliver up to uh, 20 to 30% uh, more bandwidth on the satellite transmission. So whether wants to uh, pay other less for satellite capacity or shift on the existing satellite capacity from HD, for example, to 4K or from SD to HD, they can do so by utilizing better transmission and modulation efficiencies. Excellent. We've been asked whether the slides are available, and I know that we're recording this, so there's definitely an on-demand version of this event that will be available for participants. Yeah. Are you planning right. on sharing the slides as well? Yes, of course. Excellent. Um, so some other questions for you. Do you think satellite use for broadcasts, both in distribution and contribution, will grow or decline? <laughs> I think this is a very interesting uh, question when we look at the market. So definitely we see the trend uh, in DTH that uh, is declining. We see more and more uh, sh broadcasters shift to a more uh, terrestrial uh, delivery and connectivity. Uh, and the overall spending on satellite we see also uh, decreasing a bit, but this is mostly due to uh, the price decrease of the satellite capacity. But when we look at the transponders on satellite, these are not really uh, decreasing, they're actually growing in several parts of, uh, of the world. Uh, even more than that, I've mentioned mobile, and there's today new applications that look, how can we deliver better content, higher qualities on the cellular network without congesting, congesting the, the networks, the, the, especially the backhaul network. You saw 160 meg for a single 8K, let's say, uh, stream. Uh, then obviously this is stretching uh, the mobile networks. And in the future, we definitely think that satellite will find new markets delivering the video directly to the cell towers for distribution over the mobile network, especially with 5G. So actually we think there'll be even a further growth market for uh, satellite connectivity. Okay, so I've got another question in. I'm not sure if it's a statement or it's a question, but it says BISS2CA is from Novosat or third party encryption added to the Novosat platform. It is a question now. I've looked at it closer. Okay, the BISS2CA is a Novosat solution, 
part or tailored into the Fusion uh, software, part of our software and the products that we provide with our Fusion solution. Uh, it's actually already been deployed uh, and we've made uh, public at least one of these announcements. Uh, for example, uh, in North America, where we uh, deploy this uh, for uh, Anthem Entertainment uh, and Sports uh, for two of their uh, most popular channels, Access TV and uh, HD Movies. So this was uh, already installed uh, and utilizing, utilized for uh, protecting the content to hundreds of uh, takers and locations uh, with this 2 CA, with the, uh, the management and the entitlement uh, management system uh, that goes hand in hand with it. Okay, and, and I guess this is a follow on from that question. Is the system similar to the encryption system provided by media kind? Uh, no, this is uh, this is different. Uh, when we talk about bis 2 ca obviously, then uh, it's a standard that we support. So whatever the standard support, we can uh, also connect uh, to a non-novel SAT system uh, with bis 2 ca When we're doing, for example, the encryption, we can serve uh, this kind uh, of system uh, as well. Uh, but uh, it, it's uh, it's not exactly the same okay. as uh, media. They have different. Uh, and as well, we have also the broadcaster, which is another totally different solution for protecting because this is protecting the entire transport stream, protecting also not only the payload, but also all the header and the signaling, providing a second layer of uh, protection or could be a, a single layer if you want to protect and you have the entire transport stream uh, going to your taker. This is what's typically being done uh, in most uh, major uh, sport events including uh, many recent ones during the last summer. Excellent. And what added values does Novosat see satellites can contribute to 5G MNOs? Then I, I think I just answered that a second ago. I think uh, satellite can feed the towers with content bypassing the congested backhaul uh, links and enabling to do broadcast up to that uh, location. And then we can start doing the unicast from that location to the end user devices. And by that, we will not only shorten the latency, but we will improve the quality of the video streams that we can deliver. And then we can deliver also live content at very high quality to the users. Uh, and this could generate, uh, from what we hear also from MNOs, could generate additional revenue streams and business model for them. Okay, and so can a CDN operator use this to expand their POP coverage? Can uh, again? Can a CDN operator use this to expand their POP coverage? Of course, this could be as well. It's not limited only to cell tower. This could be uh, used for any remote distribution to multiple locations. It could be, by the way, serve also a Wi-Fi uh, location, and it can also serve, by the way, delivering live content at high quality to uh, mobile mobility platforms like uh, aircrafts or uh, cruise ships uh, or ferries or even trains. Uh, we have, when we have, whenever we spend time watching things, then uh, we can probably deliver to that access uh, network, uh, local access network, we can de deliver the video through a satellite connection. Excellent. And I think the last question that we'll have time for, and a good one to end right. on, can you provide some examples for the usage of your DRM solutions? Okay, then I think I just uh, provided one for the bis 2 ca And uh, for the uh, broadcaster, uh, we, as I mentioned, we support uh, most of the major uh, global sport events are being protected uh, with uh, this kind of uh, AES-256, a broadcaster solution. Uh, some of these events I, I cannot name because we were not made public, but uh, one, that, uh, one network that was made public is the EBU network that is utilizing uh, the encryption that uh, developed by Novelsat, and it's uh, widely deployed across EBU network. Excellent.
Excellent. Thank you, Aviv. Um, thank you very, very much for that informative webinar. Really, really enjoyed it. And I'd like to thank all of our attendees for coming along today and to remind them that the um, webinar will be available on demand if they want to uh, check out again. And again, encourage them to come to your website to find out more. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Thank you, guys.